Great. I'd like to I'd like to welcome everybody uh, both here in uh, Wilmington, North Carolina, and at home participating through the webinar to um, the SoulCap workshop. Uh, when when Dave Douch has asked me to speak about breeding in the genomics era at the Potato Association of America meetings, I, I kind of scratched my head. Um, I guess the conclusion I came to is that Dave wanted me to convince you all that potatoes always taste better with ketchup. <laughs> Seriously, though, we there are there are um, there are aspects of the crops, potato and tomato, that um, create synergy. Um, so when you when you heard Robin talk about the genome sequence and the SNP discovery pipeline, um, that's a place where those of us in the tomato community have really benefited from her expertise and the pipelines that were developed for the potato part of this project. Um, on the other hand, when we start to look forward and say, where are we going to go with this technology, I think there's a place where the tomato community has something to offer to the potato community in that marker-assisted selection has been used in tomato breeding since the 1970s, um, where isozyme linkage to disease resistance um, was routinely used. Um, and so we've been thinking about marker-assisted selection for a long time. Now, I, I will acknowledge that there are major differences in the crop. We have a, a diploid inbreeding species um, that's usually commercialized in the form of hybrids uh, versus a, a um, highly heterozygous tetraploid that can be clonally propagated. Um, those represent major differences, but I think some of the overarching concepts that I'm going to talk about um, are applicable. And so what, what I really want to do in this talk is to be somewhat provocative, uh, to just to get you thinking about the future and how, as plant breeders, we should be thinking about modifying our programs to make use of the accessibility of the genomics data. Um, so having given, having given that brief introduction, I, I also want to point out that I, I will be talking some about the Illumina data that we've, we've had access to, both from um, the next generation sequencing and the array. When I talk about the array, I really have to acknowledge uh, Mathilde Kaus from INRA in France and Martin Ganell from Trade Genetics, as they also helped to um, add content to the consortium chip. Um, I also want to take a little bit of time to acknowledge um, Jeanette Martins from the Seed Biotechnology Center at UC Davis, who's helped put this workshop together, as well as uh, John McQueen at Oregon State University. So John is the person that's making sure that this broadcast gets out to our um, audience that's participating online. Okay. Just as an overview, um, what I'm going to be talking about is a, a, about a little bit about breeding strategies with, with a focus on the kinds of populations and emphasizing the size and the structure of those populations. And I will touch a little bit on, on uh, multiple trait indices. Um, I'll talk about the genotyping strategies and some of the tools, uh, but the main focus that I really want to spend most of the time on is this, this area of integrating the breeding strategies and the tools. Okay, this, this slide sort of tips my hands a little bit to indicate what I think are some really important concepts and equations for plant breeders. And what I'm trying to emphasize it, with, with this slide is that as plant breeders we work with populations that are often grown under multiple environments. And so I'm showing you some, some slides of some of our breeding trials in Ohio, and you can see that some of them are under very dry conditions and some of them are virtually underwater. And I, I think I should point out that in some cases we can get this all in one year. Um, but as breeders, we're interested in that interaction between genotype and environment. And so when we, when we think about our science, it's heavily based on the ability to separate variants into components environmental components and genetic components. And, and really, so heritability is all about that. Um, the gain under selection equation relies on separating variation into genetic and environmental components. Uh, when we talk about relative efficiency of selection, um, again, we're really talking about heritability based on trait versus the indirect selection, which would be 
molecular markers and their genetic correlation with a trait. And, and then finally, um, it, it's also important to realize that when we think about the significance of a marker associated with a trait, that the, the F test really boils down to this last equation um, where N is the population size, um, R is recombination frequency, and then um, G is a, a, an estimate of the, um, the proportion of genetic variation explained by that QTL. Okay. So just to kind of rehash this, um, we need to be able to partition variants into phenotype and genotype. Um, when, we, when we think about gain under selection, um, indirect selection is rarely going to be more efficient than direct phenotype selection. The only time where we're really going to see marker-assisted selection leading to greater gain is when we can accelerate the breeding cycle. And I think this is something very important for the potato community to think about. I think in the tomato community, we've already kind of embraced this. Um, but the main point is that um, it's very rare for a marker to explain more variation, more genetic variation than the direct phenotypic measures. Okay? And so if you're talking about gain under selection, the only way that marker-assisted selection is going to be more efficient is if you can get a couple of generations per year and accelerate the process. Right? Um, and then again, when we talk about you know, what the, really what the statistical test for a marker association with a QTL is, it's dependent on the recombination distance between the marker and the QTL, or the gene, if we want to get it down to that level, and the strength of that QTL, in other words, the proportion of genetic variance that QTL explains, and then finally, the population size. Okay? So we can't control the proportion of variance explained by the QTL. But we can control our population sizes, and to a certain extent we can now control the recombination distance because we have such an abundance of markers to work with now that it's not that hard to come up with markers that are closer to the trait. Okay. So these are, these are themes that will um, echo through the rest of the talk. Um, so the take-home messages that I want to leave you with, and I'm going to give those towards the beginning, um, which then allows you to either check out or go to sleep, um, or maybe stimulate your interest in, in listening to the rest. Um, so the, the, as plant breeders, we need to really keep our breeding programs focused on population development and phenotypic evaluation. Um, the limitations to integrating genotyping and breeding are population sizes, um, specifically how population sizes affect recombination, um, but also in terms of the power we get to test for associations. And then the other limitation is our ability to, to phenotype large populations and to do that well. Um, I think one of, one of the themes that, that Dave emphasized in his talk, and I will kind of re-emphasize is that we're getting to the point where the marker work can be very efficiently outsourced. Right? We don't all need to run a genotyping center out of our lab. Okay? And this, is, this really has profound implications on how we train our students. For those of you that have been using markers in your program, you probably bring in students and you have that student work for a couple of years collecting marker data and maybe if they're lucky they've got a couple hundred markers in a two-year period, and then they move on to the analysis phase, et cetera, et cetera. Well, Dave just talked about how you can, in theory, come up with 8,000 markers on a population in about three days, right? So our students aren't going to be spending large amounts of time getting the marker data. What we really need to have them doing is thinking about population structures, phenotyping well, and then analyzing data, okay? Um, and then finally, I think most of you have probably heard about association mapping. The, the, next, the next phase of this becomes genomic selection or genome-wide selection. Um, 
and the success of genome-wide selection is based on robust models of phenotype that include multi-trait selection indices. And I think as breeders, rather than worrying too much about the statistics behind genome-wide selection right now, what we really need to think about is our selection models. How much do we weigh the different traits? And I think the best example I can give you for that, and I'm sure there are parallels in potato, is that um, most people will tell you that the, the most important quality trait in a processing tomato is soluble solids. But I would challenge you to find somebody that actually pays for that. And if people aren't paying for it, then how can we weigh it in selection? Right? And so we, we really have to get the industry goals and desires in sync with economic models and in sync with our selection strategies. So the, the question came, do they not pay for it or do they only take varieties that have a high soluble solids anyway? Um, I think if you look at trends over time, it would be hard to make a case that um, we have improved soluble solids in tomatoes. Okay. 